Hello and welcome everyone. Um, good afternoon to most of you, but I understand it's probably good morning to some of you as well, or good evening. Um, my name is Kai Kupferschmidt. I'm a science journalist and I have the pleasure of moderating this live panel discussion today on understanding long COVID that has been put together by the German National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina. Um, I'm going to talk really, really briefly because we only have one hour and I want to make sure that we, we manage to cover as much ground as we can. But just to frame the debate a little bit, we are basically six days away from the third anniversary of this pandemic. So next week, Monday, it will be three years since the WHO declared this, um, this pandemic a public health emergency of international concern. And that's, of course, one date that you can point to as the beginning of this pandemic. I think one thing that we've all learned over the last three years is that it's much, much harder to pinpoint the end of the pandemic. But even if we could agree on when exactly it ends, I think it's important to realize that certain effects, of course, will linger. We have had huge impacts on a societal level, on a political level, but also, of course, on an individual level. And if you just think about the fact that hundreds of millions of people have lost loved ones to SARS-CoV-2 in the past three years, that is something that will stay. And we also have millions of people that are still, that have been infected with SARS-CoV-2, that have survived, but that are still struggling with some symptoms. This goes all the way from not being able to smell for years to basically not being able to do their job and live a normal life. And we have this umbrella term of long COVID, which covers all of this. And that is what we want to talk about today. I want to make one thing very clear. Um, we are not going to be able to answer all the questions that you have uh, on, on long COVID today. And that's in part because we just don't have the answers. There's a lot of things. This virus is still very new. We've still only known this for three years, this pathogen. So there's a lot of things we don't know and a lot of things that we simply cannot know. So the main thing that we want to try to do today is to disentangle a little bit what we do know, what we don't yet know, and what exactly is being done in order to find out the things that we don't yet know. And I'm really happy that I have four excellent scientists here um, on the panel who are doing some of that work on different aspects of long COVID. And before we get into the debate and the questions, I want to give each one of them, I want to introduce each one of them in turn and give them a chance to talk a little bit about the, the things that they have found out over the last three years um, on the aspect that they're working on. And I want to start with um, Akiko Iwasaki. She's an immunologist. She's actually the uh, Sterling Professor of Immunobiology and Molecular, Cellular and Developmental Biology. So a lot of biology in, in, uh, at Yale University. And amongst other things, uh, she is leading several studies on long COVID patients. And so Akiko, maybe to get us started off, you can explain a little bit what we know about the biological causes of long COVID at the moment, and in particular, how the immune system, you know, changes through the infection and, and how that impacts, impacts um, long COVID patients. Thank you very much, Kai, and thank you for having me on this panel today. Um, so I'm an immunologist. I've been studying virus infections uh, for many years. And before I begin to talk about the mechanism of long COVID, I'd like to emphasize that COVID is not alone in causing chronic post-acute infection syndromes. Many other viruses, bacteria, and parasites are known to cause similar syndromes, including myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, so the underlying causes uh, are likely to be shared by many of these pathogens, and that's something that we should be keeping in mind. Um, and as you said, long COVID is an umbrella term that describes multiple disease endotypes. So it's not going to be one medicine for all people. It's likely going to require understanding the endotypes in order to properly treat long COVID in general. So there are four main root causes that we are pursuing right now. Uh, one is viral reservoir. Um, and this could be infectious replication competent virus that's replicating somewhere in the body that's causing uh, chronic uh, inflammation. 
either by having the viral RNA triggering the innate immune response <clears throat> and or viral antigens that are uh, persistent that stimulate T and B cells, the adaptive immune response. And there are many, many papers now coming out showing that there is virus antigen as well as RNA or sometimes infectious particles that are present in various parts of the body uh, months after the acute phase of infection. So that's first root cause. Second cause may be that the acute COVID may have triggered autoimmunity. And this could be T cells uh, or, or T cells reactive to self antigens or B cells that secrete antibodies against self antigen. And there have been many links between autoimmunity and infectious diseases that have been um, studied over the years. Uh, for example, Epstein Barr virus and multiple sclerosis link has been strengthened um, in, in the past year. So it's possible that it's something that uh, autoimmunity could be triggering long COVID. Um, the third hypothesis that we're looking at is the reactivation of latent viruses, such as herpes virus family members, again, Epstein-Barr virus and uh, potentially other herpes viruses that uh, are triggered as a result of the acute infection. And since these viruses are dormant in many of us, um, and, and usually don't cause any diseases. However, during the acute phase of COVID, some people reactivate these viruses and that reactivation can cause um, new infections and new inflammation to happen. And that could be leading to long COVID. And we are seeing evidence of EBV reactivation in a subset of long COVID patients. Um, finally, it's possible that there may be tissue dysfunction and damage that's caused by the initial infection that's very difficult to repair. And this may be happening particularly in people who have had severe disease uh, during the acute phase, in which case there may be scarring in the tissue, fibrosis, things that are very difficult to repair, and that could have long-term consequences. So these are um, some of the uh, you know, root causes of long COVID, but these could be happening uh, simultaneously in people, sequentially in people, or overlapping, um, or single uh, root causes may be causing diseases. Again, the endotypes are very important to define in order for us to have biomarkers uh, so that we can start treating people appropriately. But downstream of these root causes, there are many um, dysfunction in the uh, uh, neurological and hormonal and immune system that's happening, uh, such as what we're seeing is lower levels of circulating cortisol, uh, microclots, uh, vascular damage, platelet activation. These appear to be happening in many people with long COVID. Um, and that could lead to um, many of the downstream syndromes that we're seeing. There's also sex differences that we're seeing in immune responses within the long COVID patients. So there's a lot that we need to untangle still, but it's, it's, it, we're just starting to scratch the surface of uh, the mechanism behind it. Um, and it's also very important uh, to initiate placebo-controlled randomized clinical trials uh, accompanying biomarker analysis. And this will tell us uh, not only just causes or, or potential therapies, but um, at the same time, tell us biomarkers for potential success in a particular treatment. So I'm sure we will hear a lot more, uh, more about the therapies, but uh, that's something that uh, we need to consider doing simultaneously with the basic research in order to help people with long COVID. Perfect. Thank you very much, Akiko. I think that sets up sets us up really well for the for the debate later and you know that's four hypotheses that you that you ran through that that I think all of all of them are interesting and we'll probably get back to um I want to bring in um our second panelist Mark Lequi is um the the director of the biology of infection unit at uh, Pasteur Institute and basically specialized in pathogens, viruses, all bacteria that affect the central nervous system. And as part of that, during the pandemic, he started working specifically on, on the effects that COVID-19 or that SARS-CoV-2 
has um, on the bulbous olfactorius on the on the sense of smell. We we've all heard the maybe a lot of us probably have experienced uh, the effects that that SARS-CoV-2 can have there. So, Mark, since you are studying this, can you talk a little bit about what we know about the scientific foundation of this? To many people in the beginning, I think very kind of surprising and shocking effect that that people can actually lose their sense of smell and sometimes not recover it even after recovering from the infection. Yeah, sure. So, so it's great to participate in this women. I'd like to thank the Academy for having me and, and you for your introduction. So before answering the question, I'd like to give a bit of context. So let me first remind that uh, COVID-19 caused by SARS-CoV-2, which emerged three years ago, is still a new disease, actually. And it took time to identify the specific features of SARS-CoV-2 infection in human and define this so-called new nosological entity. So very early on, however, on top of the respiratory symptoms, which are the consequence of the infection of the respiratory epithelium, SARS-CoV-2 was shown to also cause olfaction loss, which can be even complete and then called uh, olfaction loss indeed uh, became a cardinal symptom of the acute SARS-CoV-2 infection of acute COVID, at least with the initial virus, the so-called Wuhan strain. There is evidence, however, that the Delta and Omicron variants, we may, may talk about this, are not that much associated with uh, acute anosmia. So the likely cause of SARS-CoV-2 associated anosmia was initially considered as, as a mere consequence of the congestion of the olfactory epithelium, which happens with, with uh, common cold viruses. But with specific high incidence and intensity of this symptom suggested a specific mechanism that may be at play. And indeed, uh, clinical and experimental studies were uh, launched to try to understand the underlying mechanism of SARS-CoV-2 anosmia. So while it is not completely clear what precisely triggers anosmia, it is however established that it associates with both the infection of the olfactory epithelium and its ensuing inflammation. So maybe I should uh, remind that the olfactory epithelium is actually a mix of epithelial cells, which express the SARS-CoV-2 receptor called ACE2, and olfactory sensory neurons, which do not. And in humans, as well as in experimentally infected animals, such as golden hamster, which is naturally permissive to, to the virus, one can observe infection of epithelial cells and of olfactory neurons, together with cell death and signs of inflammation, including this infiltration of immune cells. So this suggests that the virus may spread directly from epithelial cells to neighboring neural cells, neuronal cells, and this indeed has been shown to occur in in vitro systems of, uh, of infection. So in patients now with prolonged anosmia, one also finds at the olfactory epithelium level the presence of viral antigens, proteins, and nucleic acids, together with inflammation. So to address now your question, so what could be the causes of prolonged anosmia? Certainly some kind of delayed regeneration of the olfactory epithelium, which could be a consequence of two things, which I already mentioned. First, prolonged infection, which could be favored by incomplete viral clearance. The virus could be replicative or not, and may be linked to the rel relative inefficacy of innate and adaptive immunity to completely clear the olfactory epithelium from SARS-CoV-2 virus, or at least its antigen. But this is also combined with prolonged inflammation due to protracted innate immune responses and, and potentially ineffic, inefficient adaptive immune responses at this site. So it appears that there is a combination of infection and inflammation that leads to prolonged anosmia. And how this would work on top of altering the overall architecture of the olfactory epithelium, which is needed for the proper functioning of olfactory neurons, there would be uh, other factors that, that could contribute to so the reduction or the alteration of the mucus that covers the olfactory epithelium, which is important for its function, the death of cells which are present in, in the tissue, and maybe also the downregulation, the specific downregulation of gene expression of other receptors. So that would be a specific uh, phenomenon, but this is yet to be shown. So there is actually a lot to be learned uh, from ongoing and, and future studies. 
Um, but, but in the in, in the context of this uh, virtual panel discussion on long COVID, which is more general than this very targeted uh, study on, on anosmia, I would like to stress that among the many symptoms that uh, can last after acute COVID, and which are which are referred to as long COVID, anosma stands out as a symptom that can be quantified, measured over time, and that the olfactory epithelium is also an easily accessible tissue, therefore making anosmia as an ideal topic of research to understand long COVID pathophysiology, or at least part of it. So just to conclude very briefly, I, I may say a few words that we can come back to this about so-called SARS-CoV-2 neurotropism. So in, in a hamster model of infection, as well as in non-human primates, the olfactory bulb, which is situated just above the olfactory epithelium, can be affected via a retrograde route. But the significance of this observation is not clear. clear. It may occur in humans, so there are contradictory results, but on autopsy uh, um, analysis, it seems to be the case. Would this lead to retrograde invasion of surrounding neural tissues via retrograde neural routes? We don't really know. What would be the impact on those tissues? This is certainly a question that remains to be answered and, and, and the significance of, of those uh, findings would need to be discussed. But I'm going to stop here and, um, and we can go, get back to, to this later. Perfect. Thank, thank you very much. So, if we're kind of looking at a spectrum of different um, different symptoms under this umbrella term long COVID, then anosmia, like Mark said, is something that's well easily quantified, um, fairly easy to study compared to other effects, um, but maybe also has less of an impact, even though it is it, it does create. It's very um, if you've ever experienced it, it's it's not very nice to have. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, of course, we have um, what what many patients described as chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, and I'm very happy that we have Carmen Scheibenbogen here. She's uh, the acting director of the Institute of Medical Immunology here, very close to me at the Charité in Berlin. And she has studied chronic fatigue syndrome for many years. Um, Carmen, may maybe you can set us up a little bit in, with what we know about this particular, this maybe the most described or most talked about um, version of long COVID that a lot of us have probably heard about. Um, for you, this wasn't even that surprising, I guess, given all the years that you've studied patients with very similar experiences. So, so what do we know at the moment about the biological causes um, of this particular type of long COVID? Yeah, thanks, Kai, for the introduction. And thanks for the opportunity to talk about this important topic and well while some consider an ECFS as a new disease it's definitely not so I'm a clinical immunologist and in our clinic we have seen patients with post-infectious chronic syndromes for more than a decade so an ECFS has actually already been known for more than a century and was classified by the WHO already in 1969 as a neurological disease um, called myalgic encephalomyelitis, which was um, described following a polio um, epidemic in uh, London. Uh, as a consequence, many, especially nurses, um, uh, developed a, a clinical syndrome resembling MECFS as we see it nowadays. However, patients um, have been misclassified as psychiatric disease, and um, this is unfortunately true until today. And thus, many physicians mm -hmm. are not familiar with the disease as it is and do not really know how to diagnose and treat it. And the situation is not only in Germany, but it's similar in most European countries and also in the United States. As a consequence, um, the care situation is poor until today, despite it is a quite frequent disease. We have an estimate of 300,000 patients in Germany being chronically ill with MECFS already before the pandemic. And this is particularly evident when you compare it um, to a disease like multiple sclerosis, which has a similar frequency, is also more frequent in females and a typical disease starting in younger patients, in which, for example, in Germany, we have more than 200 
specialized outpatient clinics compared to just two for MECFS. And we have today 16 drugs which are licensed compared to none for MECFS. So what is MECFS? It is a complex and often severe and disabling disease. And unfortunately, in adults, it's usually a chronic disease. But also children and adolescents can be affected, although less frequent and um, the prognosis is much better. MECFS is known to be triggered by various viral infections. ABV is um, the best known trigger or was the best known trigger before SARS-CoV-2. And the key symptom of the disease is actually not the fatigue. So the name chronic fatigue syndrome is um, often misleading. It's the exertion intolerance. So what does this mean? It means that um, daily activities um, in most patients can lead already to an aggravation of all symptoms, which may then last for days and weeks in which these patients are really very sick. And um, the other most important symptoms are brain fog. So uh, patients often have difficulties to concentrate, to remember. Patients usually suffer from pain in the muscles, from severe headache. Patients suffer from severe sleep disturbance. So they are tired, but they cannot sleep. And um, they often do have orthostatic problems. So um, they uh, cannot um, stand up. And this can, again, um, result in aggravation of symptoms. So um, uh, it's often claimed that the disease is so difficult to diagnose, but actually this is not true if you are familiar with the disease. So we have um, diagnostic criteria and you can measure, for example, the fatigue. The fatigue is typically also a muscle weakness and you can measure these um, orthostatic uh, problems quite easily by measuring blood pressure and heart rate while patients standing. So now coming to MECFS and long COVID. Early in the pandemic, um, patients contacted us with ongoing symptoms of fatigue, of brain fog, um, those we have known already in an ECFS. So in summer 2020, we initiated a large observational trial to answer this question, is MECFS is a consequence of COVID? And the answer is yes. So not every long COVID or post-COVID patient has MECFS, but a considerable number of these patients do develop MECFS. And now we have experience for um, almost three years. And what we've learned that um, many also of the severe um, post-COVID patients um, have got better during this time. Um, this is not the case for the MECFS patients. Um, regarding the mechanisms, I'm glad that Akiko gave already an overview on the pattern mechanisms of post-COVID syndrome because there is much overlap um, to MECFS. We do have evidence also that autoantibodies to play a role and hyperperfusion is seen in many patients and probably there's a connection uh, of autoantibodies versus hyperperfusion because um, antibodies against adrenergic anti uh, receptors may aggravate this um, diminished uh, perfusion of um, organs and tissue. And um, we also do have evidence that EBV reactivation actually plays a role in both post-COVID and MECFS, and they may be probably another um, a common pebble mechanism. And this hyperperfusion actually can explain most of the symptoms like brain fog, like um, muscle pain upon exertion. Now, the situation is, is very difficult at the moment, so we urgently need therapies now um, to treat these probably um, a million of patients suffering from long COVID and MECFS world, world. Um, but clinical studies are initiated far too slowly because there are actually numerous drugs available to target these pathomechanisms, which are already licensed in other diseases. So um, at least um, there's um, hope because um, there's no first data from small clinical trials and larger clinical trials have been initiated worldwide, but we still need much more effort to put into uh, testing more drugs and uh, understanding better the puzzle mechanism and uh, improving the care situation for these patients. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to return to the topic of treatments for sure uh, in a few minutes. But first, let me bring in our fourth panelist. I'm very happy that Michael Edelstein is here. Um, he's an epidemiologist at Bar Ilan University in Israel. And Probably the question I get the most these days from people asking me about vaccination is whether vaccination is actually going to 
um, to protect them from long COVID as well, because that obviously as, as acute COVID infection has become less and less feared, that has become more and more of an issue. So this is exactly uh, what you study, Michael, so I'm very happy you're here. Um, maybe, can you give, give us an overview of where we are on this question? What do we know about vaccination and, and you know, the reduction in risk of long COVID? Sure, thanks, Kai. So I'll, I'll try and explain and describe what we know, but also what we don't know. Um, the vaccine has clearly emerged quite early on as uh, one of the um, measures to mitigate the, the, the disease. And they were developed primarily to prevent uh, acute infection and, and prevent severe infection. But as, um, as the phenomenon of long COVID became uh, clearer, actually pretty early on in the, in the pandemic, uh, the question uh, arose as to whether uh, the vaccination would also help uh, prevent or mitigate long COVID symptoms. And since the first study coming out on the topic, probably over a year ago now, there's been uh, a few dozen studies and, and, and four meta-analyses, which are um, studies that put other studies together to look at the effect. And, and it's the consensus that is emerging is that um, vaccination uh, is associated with less reporting of symptoms that are uh, commonly associated with long COVID. Uh, some of the symptoms that my colleagues uh, mentioned, fatigue, uh, headaches, uh, brain fog, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of the disagreements of the studies is by how much, because this is an important question, will, uh, will vaccination eliminate the risk or will it decrease the risk? And it seems that if you look at the meta-analyses, when you put these studies together, the, 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 the proportion that is coming, uh, coming out is a reduction in the risk of reporting these symptoms by about 25 to 30%. Now, it's important to understand what this means and doesn't mean, uh, because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of nuance to bring here. And, and it's important to understand how these uh, studies work. What they do for most of them is they compare um, infected people who are vaccinated and infected people who are not vaccinated, and then further, further along the line, it counts, uh, the studies count how many people report uh, symptoms that uh, are associated with long COVID. Now, it's also important to, to note that a lot of these symptoms are not, not specific. You know, headache, there could be many, many re different reasons for having a headache, not necessarily and exclusively uh, being infected with COVID. So some of the studies also compare um, infected groups, infected and vaccinated groups to uh, uninfected groups to look at, to have a baseline in the general population uh, around how much of these symptoms we actually expect. And what we, again, there's, there's quite a lot of variation between the studies in terms of the size of this effect, but this, uh, this, this pooled estimate uh, around, around 25 to 30% reduction is, uh, is, is emerging. And this is important because it indicates that although uh, vaccination may help and will help decrease the burden of uh, long COVID, it's not going to be the, the silver bullet, very much like uh, acute infection. It's, a, it's an important, very important tool. As a vaccine epidemiologist, I think I have to say that, but it's not, uh, it's not, it's not the only, it's not the, the ultimate solution to the issue. Now, there's a lot of questions uh, around this that remain unanswered. One of them is, does the order matter? In other, in other terms, is being infected before vaccination different to being uh, vaccinated first and then infected? In other words, is, is the effect of the vaccine in preventing long COVID in the first place by being vaccinated at the time you get infected, or does it cure in, in, in brackets long COVID if you get vaccinated once, uh, once you're actually infected. And the evidence, while the evidence is quite clear in, uh, in, in, in people who are first vaccinated and then infected, uh, the evidence is less clear about the benefit of being vaccinated once you're, uh, once you're infected to reduce the impact of, uh, of long COVID with, with some studies, um, some studies going both ways. And I think some of the early studies didn't really 
you know, our, as our knowledge uh, improves, we understand that these questions are important. Some of the early studies didn't look at that, but the later studies do look at that. And that seems to be the, um, the consensus. It's not really entirely clear. And, and it's, not, it's not a question that the type of work I do answers, but it's the type of work that my colleagues do that will answer it. How exactly um, vaccination reduces the, the, the likelihood of long COVID symptoms. And um, there is one study we're doing, which is not published yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll share some of the insights because it's relevant to that question. Um, we know that long co the likelihood and severity of long COVID is associated with the severity of the acute illness. Meaning if you have very severe uh, acute COVID-19 and you're hospitalized, you go to intensive care, you're more likely to, um, to develop long COVID and to, have, uh, to be severely impacted by long COVID, which you know, makes sense with some of the biological hypotheses that, uh, that my colleagues um, suggested. And it seems that one of the mechanisms of action is because we know that vaccination prevents, uh, is effective against severe disease and severe disease associated with long COVID, that would be one of the mechanisms, uh, probably a very important one. But it doesn't seem to be the entire story because when we look at people who um, were infected and have long COVID, and after adjusting for the severity of disease, uh, we still see uh, a reduction in the quality of, uh, sorry, uh, uh, a reduction in quality of life in individuals uh, with long COVID who are unvaccinated compared to those who are vaccinated, which suggests that uh, in addition to reducing the likelihood of severe disease, um, it also reduces the severity of, um, of long COVID symptoms as measured by quality of life associated with, with long COVID. So uh, that, that's an early element of uh, insight of, of how vaccines may help. Now, um, there's, a, there's a lot of other questions that, that are un unanswered and I'm not going to answer all of them. An important one is the duration of protection. We, is being vaccinated at the time of infection protect you forever or like uh, protection against acute illness, uh, there's the effect disappears or wanes. And again, the, the jury's out there on, on that question. In some of our data, it seems that the, the, the effect decreases over time, but we have only very preliminary data and it certainly does not uh, answer that question uh, definitively. Um, another question is how many doses do you actually need to be protected against uh, long COVID to see the effect? And while um, what to, at least two doses seems to be better than one dose, the difference between two and three doses is, is less evident. And there's very little data of, of more than three doses. And the other, uh, the other point, and I'll, um, I'll, I'll stop here, is when we talk about COVID-19, we actually talk about a range of viruses that are quite different, meaning the latest uh, subvariants of Omicron are actually pretty different than the, the wild type that you know, emerged in, in China in late 2019. And that brings the question of, does this matter when it comes to long COVID? Do we see different uh, patterns, different likelihood of long COVID according to variant? And is the vaccine, is the effectiveness of the vaccine against long COVID differential um, according to variant? Again, there's very, very little data. So, um, it's, it's difficult to answer with, uh, with certainty, but the early data that does exist seems to suggest that, uh, that perhaps there, there is both differences in uh, proportion of patients who suffer long COVID and, um, and the effect of the vaccine. So I'm just going to conclude my opening remarks by saying that um, the, the reduction in the proportion of people reporting long COVID uh, who are vaccinated is really another reason to get vaccinated if you needed another reason. Um, but it's not going to solve the issue of long COVID. It, it, will, it will mitigate it. It will uh, decrease your likelihood of getting long COVID. It will perhaps decrease the severity of the symptoms if you're unlucky enough to get long COVID. But there's still a lot to unpack here in terms of how often, how many doses do you need? How often 
to see this effect uh, ongoing. What is the mechanism of action? How many doses you need when, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm afraid I still have more questions than answers, but uh, this is a very rapidly evolving field. And as one of my colleagues said, it's still a new disease. There's still a lot we don't understand. Perfect. Thank you very much to all four of you for now. So um, I'm very conscious of the time. We have a lot of questions, but I think it is important maybe once in a quick round at the beginning to get a sense of how big you think this problem is at a societal level. I mean, I think all of you probably have read the, the review in Nature Reviews Microbiology. I think Eric Topol and others wrote there that they assume that, I mean, they calculate or estimate that there's 65 million people suffering from long COVID. Um, maybe in the same order that we went through. So Akiko, if you can go first, what do you make of that? Is that roughly roughly what, what you think is we, we are seeing at the moment is that the scale of the problem? Yeah, um, that's the issue with long COVID is that there is no great monitoring globally for the number of people who are suffering long COVID. But that estimate of 65 million is uh, likely true, if not an undercounting, because a lot of COVID cases are um, undercounted throughout the world. So it, it may even be a larger number uh, than 65 million. Um, it's also, you know, depends on how you define long COVID and, and whether people are even aware that they have it. Uh, in some countries, long COVID is not at all discussed and people are not even aware of the situation. They may have the same set of symptoms, but they are just not sure how to even approach their physicians about their symptoms. So I think that 65 million is likely true, if not um, an underestimate of what's actually going on. Thank you. Mark, let, let me ask you, I mean, you with anosmia, you have a symptom that is so clear, you know, to, to diagnose. Um, so what is your sense of, of how, how big a problem long COVID is in terms of the, just the number of people worldwide that are affected? I think we are in a very specific situation with, with COVID and SARS-CoV-2 infection because almost all the world population has been infected uh, almost simultaneously or over a short period of time, which uh, synchronizes uh, everything and also highlights symptoms that would be relatively rare because there are so many cases that then it, it emerges. So it's both a problem and a chance. Uh, I would say after many acute viral infection, you may have um, continuing symptoms or prolonged uh, anomaly, let's say, and people don't notice it and then they, they feel tired and they whatever, but it's not related to, to, to this infection. And, and very little has been, has been done actually to really uh, understand what are the long-term impact of acute infection, whether these are encephalitis, whether these are other types of infection, they may very well have long-term uh, impact and even evolutive uh, symptoms and so on. So here with uh, COVID, we know that there is Specific it is. It is probably in anosmia is one specific thing that is not uh, so much seen with other in other situation. So I would say the, the, the short answer is that we don't know exactly the, 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 the scale of the problem, but at least here we have uh, an opportunity to really uh, follow up and understand how and hopefully devise uh, new ways of, of, of treating those, uh, which may also apply to other conditions. And as uh, it has been said also, there are, I mean, we are all infected with, with uh, persistent uh, viruses and they uh, interfere with each other. And, 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 and the, the question of those uh, persistence herpes viridae in, in multiple disease is, is, is an important one. And as you may know, for example, multiple sclerosis has been linked to uh, EBV and so on. So, so this is uh, yet another opportunity to get things uh, right and to understand. But I should say the first priority is really to define the, the, the borders, to define what patients uh, have what, so that we can have homogeneous groups and the statistical power to analyze. It's a bit uh, down to us, but it, it's important. 
Carmen, if, if I can tweak the question a little bit, since you've already worked with, with um, chronic fatigue patients for many years, how, how do you see the scale of the problem now versus the problem that was already there, right? That we didn't talk about nearly as much as we do now about long COVID, but that was always there. Where's, what, what do you make of the estimates that, that are out there? Yes, from my personal experience from the clinic, we see nowadays much more patients developing ME-CFS following COVID than following other infections. There's actually a large um, uh, data based on electronic or on health record data from uh, Germany, um, and they give a number of 0.6% of those um, having COVID developing ME-CFS in the year 2020. So I think that is an estimate with which we can at the moment calculate, and that is really a frightening number. And um, looking at the numbers of long COVID in general, I think um, there is quite good um, data from larger population-based epidemiological studies from the UK or from Netherlands. So 10%, I think, is, is a quite good estimate. The good news is that... Um, in many patients, um, the symptoms resolve within the first few months, um, but we also have to admit that after a year, approximately still three to five percent of patients are sick, and some of them are severely sick. And as I said, those with ME-CFS, we can treat symptoms, but we cannot really influence the course of the disease at the moment. Those, some of them have been sick now for three years. Michael, oh, I think we've lost Mark there, but I'm sure he's going to come back in a second. Um, my, Michael, I'm curious, since you're the epidemi epidemiologist here, um, given that we've vaccinated people you know, now for, for two years and many people have received quite a lot of shots, do we see an epidemiological signal as well that the frequency, for instance, of, of long COVID is going down a little bit as the world population overall is more vaccinated? And if not, is that a signal that indeed the, this protection that vaccination maybe gives does wane over time? Um, and so does that become at some point the main argument for, for, for keeping vaccinating people, even if, if the severe acute infections become much, much rarer? It's a very hard, uh, it's a very hard question to answer because um, there is no, as far as I know, a global ongoing surveillance of long COVID. And I think one of the one of the challenges we have is, as uh, as Akiko said, the the case definition is also not very clear. So we we don't really we don't really know what we're looking at. And and one of the really important things with understanding the epidemiology of long COVID and the role of vaccination within that is being very clear about what long COVID is and isn't. Um, not everyone who reports fatigue or a headache after having uh, COVID necessarily will have long COVID. And the other, the other issue that is not monitored very closely is the extent to which um, the symptoms affect people's quality of lives. Uh, and this is a really key issue going forward. So I think, I think putting, putting numbers is, is, is difficult, but if we... Um, if we if we estimate that, you know, if we, if we look if we take conservative estimates of ten percent of patients and the six hundred and fifty million we know is a gross underestimate because in many countries testing has stopped, uh, and of these, uh, let's say three percent have persistent symptoms over twelve months, that that is going to be tens or hundreds of millions of people worldwide, and I think there's very little doubt that it will be. Uh, a public health issues in the in the, in the months and years to come, and the role of vaccine, you know, the, the, the role of vaccine there is uh, re remains to be remains to be seen. There's there's a lot of studies that need to be run because what we do know with vaccines, it's not just a matter of are you vaccinated? Yes, no. And you're right that a lot of people uh, have been vaccinated, but we know that the effects of vaccination wane. We know that the many things matter when you are vaccinated compared to when you were infected. How many doses did you receive? When was your last dose uh, with regard to, compared to your infection, which is probably the, one of the most significant uh, issues? What vaccine you received? How many doses were, were before and after infection? So um, again, to, to, to determine the exact way to use vaccines in, in mitigating COVID, I think it's a little bit early. Um, again, what is clear is that 
um, being vaccinated prior to being infected seems to be a, a very important factor and reducing your likelihood of COVID or long COVID symptoms by a third, you know, that makes it a pretty successful intervention. And, and, and the, the little evidence that exists suggests that yes, you will need, just like you need boosters for um, reducing your ongoing risk of reinfection. And we didn't talk about reinfection in long COVID, another very important topic because each reinfection increases your risk. Then, uh, then, then it looks like you will need regular uh, boosters uh, to 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 maintain that uh, that protection. Right. I I want to try and and get to audience question. I mean, I'm already feeding in some audience questions, but but Akiko, I wanted to make sure you you laid out so beautifully these these four hypotheses, and I think that the question. <laughs> That, that's of course on everybody's mind. So how do we start to distinguish between which ones of these, if any of them or all of them, um, you know, are actually behind long COVID? Can you like just give a brief idea of how what you're doing or what needs to be done as well? Yeah, so that is why we are not uh, biased in our approach to analyzing the immune responses in patients. We're looking at all of these aspects uh, at, uh, all at the same time in, in everyone we can get our hands on. And I think we're not alone. There are many other groups that are studying uh, immunological signatures from long COVID patients. And because this is um, a, a new disease that we're studying post COVID um, uh, syndromes, we really do need to keep an open mind. Uh, so we are looking at latent virus reactivation uh, in an uh, unbiased manner by looking at antibody reactivity to you know, every viral antigens that we can get our hands on. And that's where we found, for example, the EBV reactivation in a subset of long COVID patients. Uh, we are also looking at cytokines, hormones, um, proteomics, um, everything we can you know, get our hands on to be able to uh, find out what might be causing long COVID, and are there any subsets uh, that we can already start to identify? People who have EBV, are they the same people who might have inflammation signatures or viral persistence? Uh, viral persistence has been um, looked at by others and, and including um, my lab. We are looking at circulating uh, viral antigens such as the spike protein. And uh, David Wald's group, for example, reported that about 60% of long COVID patients, but not in the control, have circulating spike protein. And that may be indicative of a persistent virus infection. So there are many tools that are being built now where we can tackle all of these hypotheses at once, but it's very important to keep an open mind about these, um, these and maybe other possibilities because we still don't understand this disease uh, from immunological perspective yet. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you are also starting one trial where you're treating long COVID patients with Paxlovid with the idea that if you, if it is a persistent infection with the virus, then treating the virus. So that's one way. Um, so, so treatment trials, of course, are one way of kind of trying to distinguish between these hypotheses as well, right? Um, so Carmen, what do we know about from, from patients, from trials, what do we know from what works in some patients about what is more likely to be the cause here? Does that help us understand a little bit what is going on? Do we have any, any data at all, any trials that, that have shown some success, at least in small trials? Well, actually in MECFS, we have few trials. Um, uh, what we know is that uh, treatments targeting autoantibodies is effective in a subgroup. And um, we um, do have um, evidence that probably inflammation is early in MECF as a pathological mechanism, a common, but um, that um, is often no longer detected about three or four years. And probably this inflammation is the driver of autoimmunity, at least in a subset of patients uh, developing than MECFS. And these um, problems of um, hyperperfusion and inflammation or malfunctioning of the vessels uh, may be probably related to both inflammation because the vessels can be um, uh, inflamed, but also to autoantibodies. So I think early on in disease, um, treatments targeting inflammation um, uh, are important to uh, study as well. And we have some evidence that certain drugs um, which ameliorate inflammation 
can help erling during disease course and um, but we have the same problem we do not know which treatment helps which patients so what we do at charity is we have now a clinical trial platform but we do a comprehensive biomarker assessment in every patients we treat irrespective of which type of therapy we do because I think it's urgent that we also understand if a patient gets better with a the therapy, um, that we understand why does this patient get better, which biomarkers are those which can um, tell us um, which is the right therapy in the end for which patients, because we also see an overlap. So some patients have inflammation, have evidence of viral persistence and do have autoantibodies. So it's very important um, to really combine research with clinical trials and do a very comprehensive analysis of all these pathomechanisms we know at the moment and it should really be done um, in large um, trial uh, consortia where we really compare different therapies um, and that actually should be an international um, uh, consortium really um, trying to have standardized uh, criteria, how to assess biomarkers, how to assess therapy effects, so that we will hopefully develop um, effective therapies um, not so far from today. Um, one, of the, one of the questions from, from the viewers, a question that I've also um, heard a lot, of course, is, is the question of what role, if any, do psychosomatic factors play? Um, do they play you know, in a subset of patients, probably? Don't know who wants to take that, but but is that something that that needs to be looked at at the same time? I mean, obviously you're all looking at biological causes, um, so so how do you think about that that part of the equation? Who wants to me to answer this question as a clinician? Well, I, I, whoever I, feels, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Of of course, it's it's. Uh, it's a very difficult situation for a young patient getting so sick. And of course, um, um, psychosomatic um, symptoms are probably part of the problem in at least a subset of patients. But what I want to emphasize is that it's not a primary psychosomatic disease in the majority of patients. It's just a comorbidity because of the uh, very difficult situations um, these patients are in. Can I add one Anybody area else? on this question? Yeah. And I, I, I don't have the answer, but uh, just, just two very quick elements of, of answer. I mean, first of all, the, the, the fact that the, the perception of, of illness is, uh, can be caused by, you know, a, 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 an illness can be caused by biological, uh, biological uh, causes, but the perception of it varies from person to person according to his own um, circumstances, social, cultural norms, etc. And that's not particularly controversial. Um, one thing that I want to say is if you look at the, if you look at the um, pro proportions of individuals that report long COVID symptoms and the effect of vaccination, it's remarkably consistent uh, across the world, across cultures, across context. And a process that is entirely psychological, you wouldn't see that because uh, these processes are very much uh, context dependent, whereas biological processes are much more likely to be uh, consistent uh, across different areas. So um, in, in my view, that, that the fact that we see this consistency of effect uh, and this consistency of reporting with very similar symptom patterns as well, whether you're in uh, you know, Southeast Asia or North America or Europe or, or, or Africa or wherever, um, that, that points towards uh, a biological process that is going on, whether it's modulated by uh, your own perception of health of illness, absolutely. But that's the, that's true for any any illness. So it's not a particularly controversial thing to say. I'd like Perfect. to thanks, also thanks for that. Yeah, if possible. <laughs> yeah. So I, I absolutely do. agree with uh, Carmen and Michael. Um, in our preprint that we studied uh, so far, about a hundred long COVID patients and controls. Um, what we're seeing is that the immunological features alone are able to predict long COVID with 96% accuracy. When we have biological data like that, um, even though, of course, people are affected by this disease and the chronic nature uh, and debilitating nature of the disease to have uh, uh, psychological symptoms as a result of these uh, diseases that are caused um, by this virus, um, there's no really need or um, 
to, to, to invoke psychosomatic uh, disease as a root cause, it's actually harmful to assign psychosomatic as a root cause of disease because the way we, we which monitor and treat patients would be uh, quite different when we do that. And that that is harmful when we know that there are biological reasons what, why these people are suffering. So thank you. Let me try and squeeze in. Oh, sorry, Mark, you wanted to say something? No, I, I just wanted to, to I, I fully agree with what has been said. And maybe I like that everything that happens post COVID should not be referred to long COVID. So, you know, it's where really the definition and with some uh, clear markers uh, are also important so, so that those patients can be followed up. It doesn't mean that the others shouldn't be taken into account, but it's important not to mix things so that we get a clear picture and, and, and we can progress in the understanding and also in, in the treatment. Let me try and squeeze in one last question from um, that came up because I think it, 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 one of the interesting features that also maybe goes towards this point that this is a biological uh, entity is we do see there are some reports of people who have post or long COVID-like symptoms after COVID vaccination um, without infection, right, from the vaccine. Um, fairly rare from what I've seen, but it does happen. Does that tell us anything about what, you know, what are possible mechanisms here? I don't know who wants to take that. Maybe Akiko. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, as you say, there's a small, we don't know what the small means, but there is a subset of people who develop long COVID-like syndrome after getting vaccinated without any infection. And we are starting to study these patients. Uh, we have a Yale Listen study, this is open, uh, where we are recruiting people with that condition. And of course, with the hypothesis that I laid out, uh, it's possible that there may be a shared mechanism of um, reactivity to the spike protein or the spike protein itself having some impact, um, sort of the viral reservoir-like sy symptom where um, having chronic antigen may trigger similar kinds of symptoms in these people. Um, and of course, this is a uh, an important subset of people that we need to study. And I do want to emphasize, I am a vaccine researcher myself. I you know, we're developing nasal vaccines and so on in order to prevent uh, further spread of the virus. Um, but we also do need to acknowledge that there are some people developing very long COVID um, related similar symptoms after vaccination. And it's very important that we study them. Let me, we're, we're almost out of time. Um, I think I mean, uh, there's enough questions in the chat for, for three more hours. I have enough questions for three more hours. I, I want to make sure that each of you has a chance really briefly in a minute, maybe to, you know, to to highlight the main message that you'd like people to take away. Because one of the issues, like now when we talk about the side effects of the vaccine, that there's, there's always the danger that, that things are weighted in a way that, that people equate them when, you know, when some things are big problems, other ones are smaller problems. So um, maybe we'll do it in the reverse order this time. Um, Michael, if you want to start, like the main message, um, you know, that people should take away from from this way too brief hour. So I'll, I, th I think the, the the key message for me is that um, first of all, we have now tons of data that show that the COVID vaccines are safe and effective, and uh, and seem to play uh, a protective role in um, in law in in reducing uh, long COVID. So I think it gives people another uh, reason to actually uh, get vaccinated and ensure that they get uh, regular doses according to the recommendations in their, in their own countries. And I want to add one thing because, uh, and Kai, we discussed this a little bit. I think we, we now live in, you know, as, as scientists, uh, and I'm sure my colleagues will agree with, I hope they will agree with me, um, COVID has really changed the way we work and the, the, the combination of an entirely new disease with uh, social media where definite answers are demanded uh, immediately makes, makes our work very difficult. And I just want to appeal for a little bit of understanding that this is an entirely new area, an entirely new virus. It takes time to, um, to get all the answers. 
and 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 sometimes we just have to we just have to deal with the uncertainty and we build the evidence as as we go along and it takes it takes time so sometimes we don't have the answers and asking for a black or white answer where there is a thousand shades in between um, makes makes things difficult and i think it, it's important to respect that scientific process and understand that we cannot give all the answers uh, straight away. Yeah, I think that's something. And if I can add as a science journalist, if you keep looking for the answer to a question, you're going to find someone in the end who answers it. But maybe when there's a lot of people before saying we don't yet know, then you know the person who finally answers it is just someone who's just willing to go out on a limb when we don't really know. So I think learning to accept that we don't know something at the moment, it's really something. I know it's hard. You don't have to love it, but I think we have to live with it. Um, Carmen, what what's the what's the number one message that you'd like people to take away from this well we must multiply our efforts we urgently need clinical trials targeting all the puzzle mechanisms we discussed today and we need um, much more input from pharmaceutical industry so patients are desperate and uh, but i am convinced that we can treat and cure them perfect thank you very much mark yeah, but just to, I mean, many has been said, but just to say that this uh, new disease and this new condition really highlights the importance of clinical research combined with basic research. And I think for, for the public at large, it's important to understand, as you just said, that we don't have answers before we can't uh, first ask the precise question. And, and we need methodology, we need a bit of time, even though there is urgency. And if the public could understand that uh, it's important to support science and, and, and medical research, that would be uh, great. Thank you. Akiko. Yes. Um, so uh, what's been said, I completely agree. Uh, we need the urgency of uh, randomized clinical trials. We, we need humility um, in treating this disease because we are at the very beginning of trying to understand a new disease. Um, and finally, I'd like to add that we need to listen and learn from patients. Um, over the pandemic, I was able to do so, and I do that on a daily basis um, because of platforms like Twitter where patients and uh, you know, researchers can engage each other. And it's a new disease, so the, the, the best expert of this disease are the patients. And in our study, we find that the patient reported outcomes alone is able to uh, classify long COVID with 94% accuracy. So I think we need to be humble, we need to be engaging patients, and we need to learn more about this new disease. That's a really nice note to end on. And just to mention that actually long COVID, the, the term itself was coined by, by patients early in 2020 as well. So um, it's one example where this, this has actually been taken up by the scientific community. Um, I know that this was way too short. Um, but thank you all so much for taking the time to do this. A video recording of this should be online on YouTube in the next few days, um, if you want to re-listen to some of it. Thank you very, very much. Um, good luck with your work and good luck to everyone. And hopefully um, we'll have another round with more answers and fewer questions soon in the future. Thank you.